Welcome everyone to the ITF Advantage All Forum. We're delighted to have two audiences joining us here today, those in the room here in Glasgow with us and those watching online via our ITF's YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. The ITF created the Advantage Hall Gender Equality Program to further tennis as an equal opportunity sport, and by extension, promote gender equality in all of sport. Advantage Hall aims to empower women to take leadership positions, raise the commercial appeal of the women's game, improve the media portrayal of women's tennis, and create a culture that includes and inspires all. We are grateful for the support of the Foundation for Global Sports Development in delivering the Advantage All program. The experts that we are proud to have with us today will address these goals in two panel sessions. For our second panel, we're thrilled that the Billie Jean King, a tireless campaigner for gender equality, is able to join us. Our first panel is going to focus on visibility and voice as we discuss eliminating gender bias. I'm very pleased to be joined here on stage by Elsa Arapi, Senior Sports Rights Manager and Women's Sports Project Lead for European Broadcasting Union, Caroline Le Petit, Head of Custom Strategy for the LTA, Jacqueline Burke, Director of Creative Insights for Getty Images, and Lori Fabiano, President of the Tory Burch Foundation. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> so to kick things off, Elsa, broadcasting remains the route to the masses with it being a key driver of value and visibility within the sporting ecosystem. Um, the EBU has been really active in promoting gender balance in sports broadcasting. Um, could you please give us an insight into some of the key findings from your reimagining sport research? And what are the really important aspects to improving visibility and giving a powerful voice to women's sport? What research has shown us is that women's sport has been ignored or at best underreported for decades. When it does cover women's sport, usually the production value is low. We have commentators that are either not experienced enough or have enough enthusiasm about what they're commentating on, and they're more likely to focus on the physical appearance of the athlete, the roles as partners or mothers, rather than their uh, performance and their athleticism. Of course, when you have major events like the Olympic Games or World Cups or a big tournament, we do get that high value broadcast, that high visibility event. But for the most part, women's sport goes off the radar in between those events. And this has been very detrimental for the development of the women's game because we have to consider that a sports program is more than a description of what happens on the field of play, who's winning and who's losing. We are conveying significance. We are telling the audience whether what they're watching has value or not. And the message so far for the women's game from the media is that it's a second-rate product. At the same time, we see that when we do offer a good quality product, we have rich content, we do create hype around it, then the audiences are there. And when we do it with consistency, then we build a fan base that is going to follow the athlete and the sport throughout the year. So if I were to, to summarize on what we need to develop the women's game from a media perspective, I would say we need to do better in terms of quality of content, in terms of quantity. We need to move beyond gender stereotypes and focus on the athlete rather than the woman. And we need to cover women's sport with consistency so that we are able to build on the engagement that we get during the big events. No, that's great. I mean, and, and after these findings, you know, how are you really communicating? You touched on a little bit, but how are you communicating with your members to, to ensure that you're collectively achieve your gender equality initiatives and your balance? Well, first of all, I want to say that for us, women's sport is a great business opportunity. 
uh, we don't see it as a CSR point or just about inspiration or um, the right thing to do. S women's sport is great sport, and it's one of the hottest trains in the industry right now, and we want our members to take advantage of this opportunity. So we focus a lot on the commercial value, and um, we really take advantage of all the data that is out there that is building on the business case. Um, in terms of how we address these problematic areas that we just talked about, uh, we have put together a set of recommendations and case studies that range from the very simple to the very ambitious, so that every organization can really pick what is the best fit for them and what they can realistically implement. When you have a community that is as large as and uh, diverse as ours, we cannot really have a one-size-fits-all solution mm -hmm. or tar the same target for everybody. Mm -hmm. The strategy has to be adapted to everyone's abilities and budgets and the cultures that they're operating in. But of course, the guiding principles really apply to everyone. Um, one of the things that really work for us is master classes on women's sport that we are delivering for our broadcast professionals. So we train people across roles and across hierarchies on how to do better on women's sport. And we cover themes like how to bring about organizational culture, targets and measurement, uh, how to portray female athletes in the way that is bias free. Um, and actually, for our next edition, we're adding a new module um, for sports federations. So we're going to be inviting our partners to share their gender equality strategies and how they are implementing them, uh, because we hope to create synergies. Uh, another thing that we do as a community is we try to build bridges between the members that are on different stages on their journey to equality so that they can learn from mm -hmm. each other, uh, see what works and what doesn't. And we also want to create a, com a sense of community around women's sport because the people that go uh, try to implement these targets need the, the, the support. <clears throat> And I think what is also uh, relevant for the people in this room is um, we feel that no one stakeholder can do this alone. So we really encourage our members to reach out to their stakeholders in their own countries. So talk to their national associations, talk to sponsors, to government agencies. Really, um, everyone that can come together and share resources and, and work with each other, because partnerships can really be a key to, to progress. No, I mean, that's great. And, you, and setting the targets with your members and constituents, you know, how are you able to hold them accountable? That is a great question and, and a, a very important one. Um, for ourselves, I have to say that we, the EBU sets a new action plan every year along with our women's sport expert group. Uh, and we are accountable to that group. And we also have initiatives that are recurring. They happen every year. So you don't have to get buy-in every year, somebody to decide every year. They sort of happen automatically. On the member side, targets are extremely effective in producing results with consistency. Not only when you have a lot going on in terms of sport events like we had this summer, for example. Um, they say that culture has strategy for breakfast because it's really easy to fall back on uh, business as usual and the old habits. But if you have a target, then you are going to go out and look for that story. You're going to cover your national league because you need the regular content. You are going to bring women on your programming as experts and as commenters because you want to normalize their presence in sport. Right. So uh, a measurement is a great first step in that process. So you measure your output, you see where you are, and then you set your targets. And you follow, you keep measuring to see how you're doing. You're able to see what works and what doesn't, and readapt your strategy. And something that I have seen 
with some of our members, and I really want to share with everyone here because I think it's very important. It's making gender a factor in every decision that you're making, whether that is deciding what rights to buy, what program to show, who you're going to hire for your sports unit. Because these decisions create new habits, and new habits form new cultures. Mm -hmm. So I would say that culture can have strategy for breakfast, but if you're very intentional with your strategy and you really pursue your objectives, then it can also work the other way around. Thank you. And, and Caroline, speaking of cultures, um, you know, digital media, social, uh, and search platforms also play an incredibly important role um, when it comes to discoverability, reach, and coverage of our sport and athletes. Um, there is, however, still a lot of work to be done in this area. And both your own research and the ITF's research concluded that there is an imbalance and skew toward male athletes and when searching on Google. I mean, they come up first before we do when you're searching our sport. Could you please talk us through some of your findings and perhaps um, just explain from a national governing body um, standpoint the detrimental effect that that has on our sport and could have on women and girls' participation? Yeah, certainly. So we, we almost came across this by chance just looking for tennis content when in, in Google. Better? Good. Um, and we noticed a significant bias. So we wanted to look into this further to quantify the problem. So we worked with our digital agency, Vakir, and the results were appalling, really. We noticed that for generic search queries like ratings and rankings, best player, top players, 98% of images that were returned were of men. 86% of videos were male dominated and 92% of the people always ask features also dominated by men. So not only in the organic search queries that were coming through, but also in those deeper search queries. Go ahead. Don't you like? Should I keep going? Keep going. Keep going. Oops. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> and so this presents for us a particular, a significant problem because if women in sports and women in sports and tennis, where we're all here yeah. not visible in Google, that is a significant uh -oh. problem. It's the dominant search engine in Great Britain. And so for an, from a national governing body perspective, thank you. From a national governing body perspective, this is detrimental for two reasons. If we're not visible when people are searching for queries about tennis, people don't believe they can be part of the game. It's not necessarily for them. But for the second reason, we know from our research that women and girls particularly they have a fear of judgment about getting on court because the sport is quite technical. And they're, they're, they fear that more so than men. And if people feel that best and top are words related just to men, I think that's just going to exacerbate the problem. And who do you think this can influence? Say again, sorry? Who do you think this can influence? Well, I think it's going to influence all women and girls. If we, as we search for top tennis players, I mean, by all means, everybody, you know, get your phones out and have a look. If you just simply search for best tennis players and you just get men, it's absolutely, it's, it's just mind-blowing that women are not appearing. And so I think everybody is going to be influenced by this huge bias that exists. But in order for us to move forward and change the mindset of these people, I mean, what actions do you think to need to be taken um, and by whom to overcome the bias of getting more women in the forefront on the search. Absolutely. So I think there's two routes here. So anyone who's producing content around tennis has a key role to play here. So everybody in this room, no doubt, all national governments have a, have a website, have digital content. And at the very basic level, having 50-50 content across men and women across their digital channels. And then thinking about the bias in Google, it also comes down to how we're tagging our content, the more technical side of content so that Google can find the content and, and list it well. So having those gender-specific terms in the tags and in the URLs. And so that's for national governing bodies, any, any media who's producing tennis content too. And then separately, there's, we do think there's a role for Google to play here as well. If you look at different sectors, for example, the arts, and you look at the cast list of a film, you'll get quite gender-equal mm -hmm. men and women actors, actresses. And so it, 
this problem seems to exist for sports in particular. So we do think there's a way of working with Google to manually maybe overcome some inherent unconscious bias that has existed in this particular algorithm. Yeah, and the other search engines that are out there as well. And so the other search it's engines, It's important yes, to course. communicate with all of them. Um, now, Jacqueline, um, I know that this is a topic close to your heart. Uh, as you have just released a framework uh, alongside the Women's Sports Trust um, to help your partners understand how they can utilize imagery on your platforms in a better way to improve the representation of women's sports across media. Could you tell us what first brought this issue to your attention um, and how have you been making changes to your business to help improve it, improve it since? Of course, um, we at Getty Images were very passionate about championing the representation of all women and girls in sports with an authentic and an inclusive lens. Now, in order to do that, actually back in 2018, we brought together a range of perspectives across the sports industry, the Women's Sport Trust, female athletes, female photographers behind the lens, uh, the media, to begin to have a conversation about closing the visibility gap around women's sports. Now, out of those conversations, back in 2018, we put together the Women and Girls in Sport Guidelines. Now, they're not a document that's set in stone. They obviously evolve as we move forward in time. So in order to really improve those guidelines, in 2020, we at Getty Images introduced Getty Images Visual GPS uh, Insights Platform. And to Elsa's point, this is really talking about you know, more and more data that's driving keener insights to begin to understand not only, well, do people really want to see greater coverage around women's sports? We're all very passionate in the room, but what does the sports fan and the non-fan, so to speak, so that opportunity here, do they want to see that? So I have great news to report, because we've been mapping this year on year. With our latest insights we've seen, that um, over seven in 10 people around the world genuinely want to see uh, sports organizations do more to promote women's sport. They do want to see female athletes having the same coverage as their male counterparts. And when it comes to their representation, how they're visualized, they have an opinion as well. Mm -hmm. And their opinion definitely comes down to the fact that 78% now want to see visuals of female athletes that is very much about their athleticism and skill and less about their beauty, their glamour or their sex appeal. So interestingly, this is growing all the time. So we're really trying to, with the Women at Sport guidelines, to evolve that, to really speak to the fact that people really um, are shaped by who they are and what they want to see in sports. So to your points as well, if we don't see that representation at all levels, we're really going to struggle to really inspire the next generation coming up, but also all levels of people right now to get involved in sport. So what's the reception been like from your commercial partners and what results yes. have you seen? So I think a, a very good concrete example um, I'll speak about a little bit is um, COVID times. There was a lot of challenge and disruption for the sports industry as a whole. We were very concerned, you know, on my own team, would that kind of upend the, the kind of good work that was continuing to be done up to the run up to the COVID times. So we very much worked with women in sport um, in the UK who identified in their research that women between the ages of 40 and 55, who were often going through the perimenopause or the menopause, um, really were not participating actively in sport. And we wanted to understand, well, what can we do? How can we keep the focus there? How can we bring an inclusive lens? So we have a created a 100% powered by women, both in front of and behind the camera, from the ideation you know, of the gallery of content to the stories that are captured by real women up and down the UK who were very much uh, welcomed us through great trust into their lives under very confined lockdown conditions at that time. But whether it was a single mom, whether it was um, you know, a, a, a person who converted their gym you know, to really keep the women in their community very active, whether it was a friendship group with Oprah World in swimming, or whether it was a 40 plus you know, football club, 
and we captured those stories. So as a measure of success, to really begin to understand, you know, was that picked up by our commercial partners? Was that used to tell stories, whether it's for advertising purposes or new sport and entertainment? Yes, it was. So a story that was authentically UK, that had the very bad weather in the UK, um, that was actually picked up uh, in more than 40 plus countries around the world. So it just shows that if you do focus on the visual storytelling and you do bring that inclusive lens uh, to women and girls in sport, people will actively move towards it and do understand that by using it, they are being more relatable and inspiring people within the sport. No, absolutely, because positive imagery is, is what we need to promote anything. And so when we're talking about Google search or other search engines, what the image that comes up is important, which is also what's important, what's being broadcast as well. So we have to make sure that we can continue to get those positive image, images out of women and girls and, and diverse and inclusive audiences um, as a whole. So thank you for that. Lori, the Tory Burch Foundation is all about challenging bias and supporting women entrepreneurs. Um, with that in mind, what tools do you think are needed to support aspiring women in sports business and in general to overcome stereotypes and bias to become successful in their chosen fields? So I don't think it's very different um, between women in sports and, and women across the world. Um, we are all biased, every single one of us on this stage, in this audience, and I think an awareness of unconscious bias and also called implicit bias is, is really, really the key to changing bias. There aren't any easy tools. It's constant. Our brains are wired to be biased. It's, it's a defense mechanism from the dawn of time. So you constantly have to challenge your thought processes. And yes, targets are really, really important, but it's also important to go deep and figure out what your own bias is. Um, we often have people say to us, well, you know, we're a venture capital firm and, and, you know, we give an equal number of meetings to women as we do to men because access to capital is so key for women entrepreneurs. Well, the questions are different. The questions are different because they're, the questions tend to be all about risk other than promotion. And it's coming from a place of bias. So you have to really go deep every time you make one of these decisions, and it's, it is something that you're constantly going to have to ask yourself, no matter how enlightened you think you might be. I also think that when you make strides, you have to trumpet them. Um, you, the tennis world has gone farther for women than any other area in sports, and I don't see you talking about that. You should be. You really should be. The fact that there is um, pay parity is, is extraordinary. You could be the example to get other people there. You could really be the example for other sports and other industries. Um, when it works, talk about it. And, and to all the men in this room, talk about it, how exciting that game was last night. People need to hear men talk about how exciting women's sports are. That's what changes when your sons hear that and they think it's great. And the other thing is don't talk about equality without talking about inclusivity. We feel really strongly, unless it's all of us, unless it's women of every color, we're not, we're not getting where we need to be. Well, you, you, spoke, you spoke about parity and the prize money, and tennis is one of the few sports that has equal prize money. Do you think there's an underlying bias in the way that success for women in sport and business is treated versus men, and how important was that message in creating parity in your decision to be involved in the Billie Jean King Cup? Well, it was important because of Billy. Um, both Tori and myself is, have admired Billy since you know we were kids, and Billy was talking about inclusivity decades before anybody else was, and that was really important to us. So the fact that you had achieved that parity wasn't why we did it. We did it because your values, Billy's values, were the same. I mean, all good relationships, private or public, start with shared values. So um, that's why we did it, and I do think that successful women 
you know, everybody's tired of being held up as the one example. You know, when women become successful, so I had a message to the men in the room, talk about, to the women in the room, talk about the other successful women. You know, bring everybody along. That's what it's going to take. Well, Billy's always spoken that you have to see it to believe it. And she's been a beacon of change since the beginning um, for all of us in sport and in women in business. And it's evident when we talk about visibility and vision and how we're viewed as women and girls within our sport. Within, our, within your organization, and I'll start with you, um, it, 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 there's been priority placed on improving the visibility of women's sports, particularly with the LTA and, and any of the other um, federations that are out here. Have there been internal barriers um, to overcome to get to this point? Well, we're very lucky at the LTA. The, the She Rallies ambition that we published earlier this year around gender equalities follows on from the launch of our inclusion strategy last year, which has support at board level. So this really did start at the top and has been filtering through the organization, which is absolutely fantastic. In some areas of the organization, it's been a lot easier and quicker to quickly put that insight into people's work and to help them to think slightly differently. And of course, that's going to take time to go across all parts of the organization. But there are certain people, myself included, who continue to be protagonists and just to keep chipping away and learning a lot more and helping the organization along from top to bottom. Elsa, have you seen any of the barriers on the inside? Um, yes, it has to do with uh, resistance to change, I would say. Um, it's easier to continue to do things as you were. Your work processes are the same, you know who to talk to, um, the, the culture is the same, um, and this is the one that really takes the longer to change, that's why I talked before about targets and intentionality. Um, but I do think that if you get leadership buy-in, then you really are making a very big step because they can then trigger all of these changes that are um, important to take place. No, it's important. I mean, we've seen a lot of conversation generated about the choice of apparel in women's sports over the past few years. Um, and Tori, I'll, I'll come to you with that. Um, does the media have an issue with the sexualization of female athletes and how do you think it has influenced um, interest and respect for women's sport as you are getting into tennis? Well, well, certainly in the past, the sexualization has dumbed it down for women athletes and, you know, put the focus obviously on where it shouldn't be. I do feel that women should be authentic <laughs> to themselves, though. So, you know, if a woman chooses to wear a cat suit or whatever she is going to wear on, on the court, that should be respected. And, and it's a, a real footnote in, in her game. Um, it's not what anybody should be focusing on. But there, I mean, I think it's, you asked the question about what are the things, what are the impediments for, for women entrepreneurs, and I think it's the same in sport, it's access to capital, which is why this issue of pay parity is so important and you should be talking about it. Um, in the United States, only one in 23 uh, loan dollars go to women and they start businesses at a greater rate than men. Um, less than 3% of venture capital goes there. Those are horrific statistics, and people have to keep talking about them um, for any change to happen. Jackie, you know, we talk about photos. I mean, mm -hmm. the, we're, we're on social media all the time. It's all about photos, right? You're attracted to the photo versus the story. But as we are promoting women and girls in our sport, globally. It's a lot of different cultures that are represented in this room and, and on, on YouTube today. What advice would you give to these tennis federations with the images that they're putting out there that are obviously positive, as we talked about, mm -hmm. but to, to, to promote our sport in a, in a more engaging way? Well, I think this is where the Women and Girls in Sport guidelines that we've put together is very helpful because we're really trying to look at the different layers of identity a young girl, you know, a female athlete might identify with, and it's not always just one layer of identity. So how do you begin to ask yourself, where's my unconscious bias? If I look at, you know, my visual strategy and how I've increased the visibility on women's sport within my country, 
well, what are the types of visual stories that I tend to go to all the time to represent that story, whether it's at an elite or a grassroots level? So, you know, am I given an equitable, you know, range of options for how women and girls of all ages, for instance, are being visualized? Um, am I representing all types of body shapes, sizes, abilities? Um, am I looking at telling wider stories that are not just focused on the female players, for instance, but am I looking at the rich female support staff, the umpires, the volunteers, the ball girls? How am I bringing an intersectional lens that will really inspire everyone? And again, it's a, it, it's a very difficult process, but if you bring that intentionality, if you slow it down, if you try to be more mindful, and I think the key word I think Elsa brought up there, it's about collaboration as well. We're on this collaborative journey. Um, we need to look around to be inspired ourselves. So I think, again, just building that out and being very mindful of it and getting all those feedback loops and bringing lots of voices to the table can help move towards an unbiased storytelling if it's at all possible, but to begin to do that step by step. Thank you, and Elsa, sticking with the global audience that we have, um, with so many tuning in, um, all from which, again, come from different traditions and cultures. If you were at ground zero, um, but wanted to break the mold and, and create change within the organization, where would you begin, and, and what are the first steps? If I may just follow up a oh, little bit do. on uh, what Jackie was saying, uh, I think we also need to look at the way we portray men in sport, because that is sort of the other side of the same coin. And I want to say how much I loved in September that photo of um, Rafael Nadal and uh, Roger Federer holding hands and crying. And I thought that how unfair is it that men always have to be unbreakable, mm -hmm. and they always have to be resilient and strong. We deny them this opportunity to show emotion and to share moments like that, because what are the people going to think? So I think if we want to break gender stereotypes, we have to, put, to do it on both sides. Um, well, that, that's a great follow-up, because after dinner last night, we actually had a conversation and a laugh about that. Um, and I think it is important that we are seeing men and women in the same light of being emotional and sharing these sentimental moments um, without having the stereotype um, behind it. So great, great comment. Yeah. <clears throat> so in terms of culture, uh, I think I sort of covered that, in what I was saying before. Um, the guiding principles need to be the same but they also need to be um, adapted to the culture. For example, we always say to our members, focus on the athlete and not the gender. But there are countries where women do not participate in sport, they do not pursue careers in sport because for them, that means that they cannot have a family. So they need that they have to make the choice. In those spaces, the broadcasters does um, show stories where women have done both in order to tell girls that actually this is a path for you and you don't have to choose. Uh, in terms of where to start, yes, I get leadership is very important. Although you need everyone to grow, even the naysayers, because they will point you to the directions that you need to improve. No, absolutely. And Caroline, just again from, from the governing body perspective, um, how Difficult has it been to have the gender balance and making sure that we're supporting the women equally to men um, just within your organization and then making sure that we're spreading that amongst our audience, that we are equal and there should be parity in everything that we're doing in developing our sport. Absolutely. So, you know, we started with the, with the, num with the numbers, really. We, you know, are looking to grow the game and recognizing that 40% of our adult playing base is women. I think everyone can get on board and recognize that that's, a, that's something we absolutely need to improve. So talking about that with everybody and understanding the size of the prize is, uh, is so, so important. And talking about it regularly with everybody in the organization has been absolutely paramount. And what we found has really worked and is certainly something we're on a journey to though is, is truly understanding 
the issues. So we had a little bit of a look internally and realized that actually the, the questions we were asking also had some unconscious bias in them. So we've gone right back to the beginning, changed our questions, got some new answers. So it gives us a little bit more, uh, more knowledge, more enthusiasm actually to take back to everybody and to get everybody on board and move forward. I mean, this, these comments are just so important for us to make sure that we're soaking up, soaking up and taking in so that we can take them back to our respective nations and, and try to implement them wherever we can. But we're, you, we're focusing on the visibility of our sport. But within this, this visibility is empowerment and how we are empowering our girls and women to be proud of who they are and to stand up and represent. And Lori, with the Tory Burch Foundation, I mean, you, you touched on that, but how important is it when you're talking about the leadership of our women and girls that we are giving them the opportunity to feel empowered to go out and represent their gender? It, it's critical, um, but I would, the one thing I'd say is equality doesn't mean we're the same. It just means we're equal. So you have to ask the questions. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of athletes now like Allison Felix who are talking about being a mother and a woman athlete. You know, what are the issues facing, you know, women athletes and athletes of color that we could also be looking at? And so people don't need to be treated, treated the same, they just need to be treated equally. And it's, it's critical that young girls see us doing that. And back to Billy, you know, always saying you have to see it to be it. And there could be nothing truer than that statement. And Jackie, from um, a photographer's or image perspective, how are we engaging our young girls to want to be behind the camera? to capture those images that they want to see. Again, you have to see it to believe it. So what policies, not policies, but programs do you have in place perhaps for these young girls to get engaged, to, to want to be able to promote the positive images that we've discussed? So that was very important to us when we originally kicked off this discussion back in 2018 with the Women's Sport Trust and we put together an internship program to actually really invite and create a culture of belonging you know, within the capturing of the sport because it can be often difficult to inspire people when it can be quite male dominated. So looking at very simple things like when you travel, you know, you know, are you getting your own room when you're behind the lens? You know, are, is there a mutual respect that's happening? So I have to say the internship program we kicked off in 2018 has been very successful. We've got two full-time female employed staff now from that program. Um, uh, Kath Eiffel and Naomi Baker who've been traveling the world and again I think it's just building that and seeing more females behind the camera that's capturing those stories. Now, I'll also just add on that, and it's a slightly more nuanced point, but when we had this conversation with female athletes back in 2018, you know, there was a lot of um, awareness brought to the fact that they would prefer a female behind the lens. But interestingly, that has actually shifted. So, when we talked to the Women's Sport Trust were very kind and they brought us into their Unlock program to talk to a wide variety of uh, females involved in different sports disciplines. And actually, the question is beginning to increase a little bit more towards intersectionality. So it's towards the whole experience of individuals behind the camera that the athlete feels that they can actually identify with. And it becomes a relationship of trust and to Laurie's point, really allowing themselves to bring their own authentic selves. Mm -hmm. So again, on that question of the sports fans, let's say, or the end consumer wanting to see uh, an inclusive story around athleticism and skill, you know, when we've worked with uh, different female athletes for different sports organizations, sometimes they want to determine, you know, how they look, how they've styled themselves for headshots, for instance, and also just more a sense of, well, are they being retouched? How are they being retouched? Do they have choice on that? Can they inform on that? So it opens up a much wider, I think, conversation about trust and about understanding all senses of experiences. Well, I think that's a great way for us to wrap things up um, because trust is the first thing that has to happen in order for our counterparts to be able to embrace our differences and, and who we are as, as women and girls, not only in sport, but as in, in business. So please join me in saying thank you and giving a big round of applause to our panelists.
So now the theme of our second panel discussion is value, and we're going to turn our attention to commercializing um, women's sport, and I'm pleased to turn things over to Jay Stewart, who will introduce um, our new thank panel you, panelists. Oh, Jay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us here. We're, we're going to be discussing, uh, the, the title of it is Portrayal Pays Commercializing Women's Sport. The, um, the interesting thing as I was listening to this, this first panel was talking about visibility. Uh, and of course, visibility is hugely important, but there is a big step, as I'm sure our panelists will agree, between, between visibility and being visible and actually being commercial. And I think that this is something that is, uh, uh, can be a challenge. So let me introduce our, our panelists first. I'll start um, at, at that end with uh, Wanjiru uh, Umbragra uh, Karani from uh, Tennis Kenya. Mm -hmm. We also have with us um, from Tunisia, we have um, uh, uh, Salma uh, Mula Guizani. I'll, I'll introduce Ilana, next to us. Here's Bill. Great. We found him. Hello. I'll introduce sorry. Ilana, who's next. To, I'll introduce <laughs> Ilana, who's next to me, uh, first. Ilana Kloss, uh, who is the CEO of Billy Jean King Foundation. Ilana, of course, is uh, was uh, watching this good tennis that we've seen over the past few days. Was a world number one doubles player and was a Billy Jean King uh, represented South Africa in the Billy Jean King uh, Cup as well. Bill Shelton, who has now joined us, uh, Chief Marketing Officer of Group 1001, which is the parent of the sponsor of the Billie Jean King Cup, uh, Gamebridge, and of course, someone who needs no introduction, which makes it that much more pleasurable to introduce her. Uh, global icon, visionary, founder of Billie Jean King Enterprises, uh, Billie Jean King. So let's give them all a look. Now, before we get started, we're going to talk about commercializing women's sport. I don't know if, if, if you've all read this book, but this is a, a really almost a handbook on what's happened uh, over the past years in terms of the progress. Billy's uh, recent autobiography, All In. And one of the things that Lori mentioned in the, um, in the first panel is something that's mentioned explicitly by, by Billy in this, which is, you know, we're talking portrayal pills, commercial portrayal pays commercializing women's sport. Notice it's not women's tennis. And we're here at a tennis gathering and we're talking about sport in general. And I think the reason is, you know, Billy, as you say in the book here, uh, today Ilana and I help other women athletes in sports, including soccer, ice hockey, and cricket to grow their games. Yet tennis remains the leader in women's sports. Tennis has shown what's possible and remains a model that other sports emulate. So if we were to begin, uh, let's begin with you, uh, Billie Jean, that if you could give us some historical perspective on um, why that's the case and how that's come to be the case, that it's not only a question of, um, uh, uh, of the portrayal of women's sports, which is important, but that it's grown commercially as well and those things have been hand in hand. So if you could give us a, a an idea of how we've made this progress. Well, I just want to stand so I can see people in the back there. Hi. <laughs> Hi, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think one thing I'd like everyone to think about before we start this is that unless you've been excluded, we don't ever understand what inclusion means. Until we've been excluded, we do not understand when we talk about inclusion. So I like you to think about all your own lives. Usually someone's been excluded somewhere, sometime. Now I'll sit back down. <laughs> so because all of your leaders here, I think uh, I'm big on understanding history. The more you know about history, the more you know about yourself. But the most important thing, it helps us shape the future. And I love history, and I love tennis history. So that's really what helped me make decisions to understand the past. How do we move forward to the future? And every one of you here has such power to change things and make it better for everyone. So 
So as we go through these discussions, I want you to really understand you are the leadership in tennis. And great leaders, the really great leaders, are the ones who think about others and not just themselves to get better in the climbing or whatever. It's really caring about our sport. How can I make it better from the grassroots all the way up? And so what happened in tennis, tennis was an amateur sport. I'll just talk about myself here. I got $14 a day. And I hated being an amateur. I grew up around pro sports as a baby, as a child. NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, all the big team sports. I, I played all team sports. Never heard of tennis until someone asked me in fifth grade, do you want to play tennis? And I said, what's tennis? So tennis didn't, didn't touch my heart and mind until a friend and everything is in relationships are everything. <coughs> Think about that, relationships are everything, really they are. So as I got into tennis, I wanted to change it to be a pro sport. Because if you're an amateur, it's a hobby. If you're a pro, it means you're really good. Kids think, if you say I'm a pro, they go, oh, wow, you're really good. So when 1968 came about, and some of you here will probably know this history, that they decided to make our, open it up, make it professional. And I would say that the All England Club and the LTA were big in making that happen. Herman David um, at Wimbledon, everything. He saw the writing on the wall. So 1968 comes around and it's pro. So Rod Laver wins Wimbledon and he gets 2,000 pounds. I know. <laughs> and I got 750 pounds. So I got 30, what are 37.5% of what the men got. So I went, oh no, about that too, because I got in trouble with trying to make it pro, and now the next problem is, <clears throat> who decided this? I mean, I thought we'd just get our checks would be the same and we'd move on. So I thought in the back of my head, that's another fight. So then I went to the men and I said, let's be one association. And they said, no. And I went back a lot of times, <laughs> sometimes. So in 1970, there were nine of us called the original nine. You may or may or not have heard it. We got inducted to the Hall of Fame last year. We decided that we would give up our careers and try to worry about the future generations. We signed a $1 contract with Gladys Hellman, who was the uh, publisher of World Tennis Magazine, and she went out and got a sponsor, because follow the money. If you don't have the money, I don't care how big your aspirations are. So I'm big on money. It's for what it can do for all of us. So we had this tournament, and we did get suspended. We got suspended, we got, re then they let us, it was a nightmare. And here's the three things that we wanted. These three things are really important. Number one, that any girl in this world, any girl, if she's good enough, would have a place to compete. I said compete, not play. Compete. And number two, that we would finally be appreciated for our accomplishments, not only our looks. And number three, the most important to all of us, because we came from the $14 a day, mm. is that we would be able to make a living. Those were the three things we decided, go ahead and suspend us if we never get to play again. And many of us were at the the center of our careers. I mean, we're talking about giving it up. We're giving it up. We weren't old and retiring or anything. In fact, we're on the younger side. So we were willing to do this for the future generations. But because of that, we had a tour in 71. And that, when we signed that $1 contract, it's the birth of women's professional tennis. That you see today, any check that a woman gets in the ITF tournaments, WTA, majors, I don't care what it is, that day is the reason this has happened. So we were all still alive, barely, but we're all still alive and we're so proud that every time we see a woman get a check, we don't care what the amount is, that she's appreciated. And we still are big on looks. We still haven't gotten over that, but we, we're getting better. 
like what the, the panel before us talked about. But that's why we have it. And then we ha our, our next thing was to make the majors equal. Because it's also about the message, not just the money. And you never know how you're going to touch another person's life or how they're going to touch yours. I always envisioned a woman in a village in Africa actually seeing this. I don't think she had TV, but if she could see it or read it or anything, I wonder what that would do to her that they get equal money. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's how it got started. You know, Bill, Billie Jean, one of the things I, I remember from the book is, is when you were together with the men turning pro um, and making that transition and, 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 and actually going for it, mm -hmm. Not to point fingers, but the, the men started to drift away, didn't they? I mean, they, the, they didn't the, the, want us, the, actually. The, the, the support was not there. No. Do you think that picture has improved? Yes. Um, this is where men are really important, because if I hadn't had men allies <clears throat> along the way, all of us, not just me, uh, not, we would not be where we are, especially in the sponsorship area. The part, I call it a partnership, because men have more power. They have more money. And all of you that have a daughter, I would hope, my dad was great. He believed in me as much as my younger brother, who also became a professional athlete. He played 12 years of baseball, which for most of us here, they go, huh? Mm -hmm. It's a huge sport in America. But because my dad believed in me as much as my brother, I can tell you, set the foundation for me to have confidence. Because he believed in me as much as my brother. And I cannot tell you, and I didn't realize it at the time, how important that was. But all of you here, most of you are men, you have the power to change things. And I think the question is, what legacy do I want to leave in my life? When I look in the mirror at my age, and, and what do you want to say about yourself? Forget what the world thinks. What do you want to say about yourself? What do you really want? You know what the right thing is to do and how to be on the right side of history. But you have the power to change things. And I'm talking about from grassroots, which is vital. It's vital to get grassroots right. And that you'll spend as much on the girls as the boys. It's absolutely vital. And if you have a woman that does well in your country, it, she can inspire kids to play just as much as a guy. It's your, it's your person. Like Jabour would be a perfect example of what's happening in Tunisia. The kids are very, they're so excited. Everyone's excited. She does so well. So I just hope that all of you will think about your legacy and what you really want. And you can make such a difference. That, you know, you got to force yourself sometimes to do things. It's tough. We'll be talking about the impact of these, these players. Um, but, Elena, before we go there, what are the positive things that you see about the situation now in terms of the commercialization of, of, um, of tennis and uh, women's tennis and women's sport more generally? What, what, against the backdrop of your own experience? Well, I think there's no question. This feels like there's a tipping point in other sports. I think tennis has been incredibly successful at the majors, uh, not always at the lower level tournaments, but I think the thing that's really going to change that is exposure. And the previous panel talked a lot about that. And so I think it's critical that um, women get more exposure. I mean, if you know someone's story, then you're interested. But if you're only getting 10% five to 10% of the media exposure when 40% of athletes, of women athletes, are, you know, are involved in sport, you have to know someone's story to want to invest in them and pull for them. And so I think while we are doing well at the four majors, there still um, is opportunity for growth. But more importantly, um, I think investing in women at the grassroots level, like <coughs> Billie Jean says, and when you sit here on the stage and you see the success in Kenya, when you see the success in Tunisia, if you give young girls an opportunity and you believe in them, they'll succeed. And the potential is huge. There's a great opportunity in, in women's sports because 
it just is not as mature as, as men's sports, whether it's tennis or anything else. Uh, tennis has been very fortunate that you have men and women play together. But I think we still need to invest in women's tennis a lot more. And if you do that, you'll see the results. And I think when I think about investing, it's money, it's emotion, and it's time. It's all three of those things that I think will pay off in the long run. Do you think we might be going through a period right now where there's a sense, uh, for a lot of social reasons, but also because of the success of certain teams and certain events, that women's sport has really turned a corner and that everything is going to be rosy going forward and that maybe there might be more challenges ahead? Um, and, and, and is it about investing in the grassroots to make sure that that momentum continues? Well, absolutely. I think, um, like I say, women's tennis has been the leader. Where we're starting to see uh, greater success and interest is in women's team sports. And I think, for me, what's really exciting, um, as someone who believes in women and in women's sports, is to see um, significant investors willing to put their money in, in women's tennis, in women's sports, for the long term. And so when you start getting the same owners that own male teams or teams in, in leagues uh, or tournaments, I think that sends an unbelievable message and I think we're really starting to see that. And that's the tipping point that we see. More fans are watching women's sports, they want to see it. Uh, I think actually women are much more loyal fans than men are because they have to struggle to find the content. So I think it's great to see significant uh, investment uh, in women's sports because that's going to make a difference mm -hmm. and you have to invest for the long term. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you say this because something that just popped into my head about credibility of the ownership. Um, if you remember when eSports first started to become a big thing, gaming got very big, then eSports and some of the big owners of big franchises started to get into eSports and there was eSports investment by NFL owners and NBA. And then suddenly it was, oh, eSports is, must be okay because the NFL team is invested in, in eSports. And I think we're maybe starting to see the same, same thing here. Of course, we'll get to the ownership issue a little bit later with, with yourselves. Bill, I know you, you um, uh, believe that uh, women's sport has made big uh, advances, but also that it hasn't come as far uh, as, as it could. And, there, and that there are, some, there are some real reasons for this within the way that, that, that um, commercialization works and the yeah. way that uh, the whole yeah. market works. First of all, yeah, that's a great question. First of all, I think our, our, our goal should be more than equal, right? <laughs> when it was 100% men, we would just accept that. So I want women's sports to be 70 or 80% of the sponsorship dollars, you understand? And it can fluctuate over time. So not always 70 to 80, it might be 40, but also just higher aspirations. Um, one of the things in business, I have a, uh, uh, an engineering degree, and what matters is what you measure, right? And one of the things that I hear in men's sports a lot, or, or people who are in my position as a chief marketing officer is, well, men's sports are just more popular. I tend, <laughs> no you know, and, and I tend <laughs> no to, kidding. and I said, based upon what? Because I, I like to understand, you know? But one of the things that I, I found in, is that a lot of times what's measured is wrong. And I'll give mm -hmm. you just one example. So, you know, um, when, you, when people are looking at uh, Nielsen ratings, for example, and say, okay, the men are being watched more than the women. Yeah. What they're missing is women's sports are watched more on streaming Absolutely. and data yeah. on people's phones and smart. Yeah. That's not being measured in the numbers that are given to the companies. That's a yeah. big, big difference. Yeah. So what matters is what you measure. And I think we have to do a better job of finding that data to support it. That's one example. Mm -hmm. So, so, so there, is a, the, is, there is the need to be harnessing, harnessing the data and being able to put that, put that story together, which is, I mean, a lot of sports are wrestling with this uh, more generally, but maybe w women's sport is in a good position because they can, they can start to get their teeth into it. Yeah, I also, early. I think it's, um, as corporations in our company, what we did is we were analyzing our, our, our client base too, and 60% of the people who were buying annuities were women. But yet, so little of the money was being spent. I think less than 5% in the United States was being spent on, on women. And our goal is we're spending significant amount. We sponsor this event. We are sponsoring, starting in 23, of the Annika Sorenstam event in, in Pelican, Florida. So we're trying to get to parity in what we spend because we think it not only is good for society, but it's good for our business. 
Lana, let, let me get to a point, um, which is this question of money, and we're talking about money, and Billie Jean says, I like money. I mean, I mean it, it's important. But you know, do you think women are good enough about following the money? Do you think there is enough confidence among female athletes, but, but among women generally, um, about making their economic uh, uh, voice heard and about actually just personally feeling this is what I want? Well, or is I think there still a way to go? Of course there's a way to go, um, but I still believe you do have to see it to be it. And so the more examples we have of women being successful, of w women wanting to lift others up, uh, and you know, I, I do want to give a shout out to Cambridge because their investment in uh, women's tennis and women's golf and, and trying to equalize that is huge. And I think that corporations really have the ability to change things big time. Uh, you know, a CEO can wake up or go to bed at night and say, you know what, our company is now going to invest equally in women as in men. And that's an unbelievable message because your employees love that. Just like Bill said, a lot of your customers are, are men and women. So I think CEOs have incredible power to change culture. And the more women we see saying, you know, it's okay to cheer, it's okay to be proud of what you won, uh, because I think it gives you confidence and more importantly, it inspires others to follow. And, uh, you know, for us, I think um, being in tennis and having grown up in South Africa and, you know, been lucky enough to be able to play tennis and earn a living doing that, I think uh, it was huge that we could see that. I, I could see that and I had an opportunity to live it and to see now people and uh, governments and companies investing in women I think we're just beginning, to be honest. Well, if you see, we were talking about tennis being a leader. We have now tennis parity in a lot of the events. We still have in some sports, the women are saying, you know, we should be getting equal, equal money, and that's still a battle that's going on. But is that the, founda is that the necessary foundation for commercial, being, for commercial growth, to start with, with equal, let's call it equal reward? Well. Look, I think in, in tennis, um, especially at the four majors, when the product is sold together, um, you're selling the sponsorship rights, you're selling the uh, media rights together, absolutely it should be equal. An entertainer doesn't get paid more or less because they sing longer or shorter. Um, but, you know, I do think um, when the men and women are separate, actually the marketplace does determine that. And even in tennis, we don't always get equal. In some events, we might get more. In some events, we might get less. And, and the marketplace will determine <coughs> that. But that's why it's hugely important to push for additional exposure. Because when you get exposure and people know right. who you are and what you do, I think then they want to invest more. Right. Um, but you know, I think uh, it's, it's a journey and it's a process. And I don't think... Um, you know, women are saying, just give it to us. Yep. We're very happy to earn it, but you have to have the opportunity and access uh, in order to be able to do that. So it's step by step. And, it, it, and, and you're making the point that it can't just be this idea of we, we play the same sport you do, so we should get the same money you do. There has to be, you know, <laughs> yeah. there, has, you know there has to be something that's joined up in there. Bill, you know, you got involved with, uh, with the Billie Jean. That, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Billie Bill. Jean King, one of the things that attracted you to the Billie Jean King Cup was this idea of, uh, of, of the equal money now as, as Gainbridge? A hundred percent, you know, and I, I think that that has to be the start. And I believe, you know, the marketplace is some size is, is circular, you know, as an expert in finance. And sometimes you have to almost establish something and then prove it. So for example, for many years in the United States, you could pay me less than uh, my white counterpart just because of the color of my skin, right? And so would the government changed that by establishing that that was against the law. Sometimes I think we have to look at that, and I don't know if law is the uh, solution in this case, but public pressure is, okay? And I believe that we should hold accountable our corporations to spend equal money. I think um, Billy was sharing an example of let's, let's just have some way that we can boycott, let's say, all the fans of us are in women's sports or do something to show the sponsors how powerful 
our, our, our group is. So yes, I, I totally believe that equality is it's, it's, it, it's imperative for a lot of reasons. But just as a societal good one, what are we telling our daughters and our sons that's important of when we are paying equal, I mean, not, you know, different things for the same, for the same quality of work. And the stories, when I was, I was, I love Broadway, but when I watched Stormy yesterday in the Australian match after coming back, I was cheering like a first row of Broadway. And those kind of stories aren't shown on the media enough, right? No. So I think that, you know, for me, it's aspirational to start there, even if the data isn't totally supportive of that right now. Um, and, and I've seen research recently, and there has been a lot showing that brands are very sensitive to this now. I mean, it's very clear that the public is expecting brands to, to behave in a different way, and not only to talk the talk, but to also you know, get, walk the walk and get behind what, they, what they're showing as their positions. And I think this is becoming more and more important. So I think that's something that, that bodes well if you're trying to make progress in an, in an area that's, uh, where there's some value and where it's important, because all these things are connected. It's not just women's sport, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's everything. But if we can shift gears, because uh, we have a room full of people from, um, from various parts of the world, and for many of the countries that are represented here, uh, the, the commercial conversations that might be had in the more developed markets are, are not really strictly relevant. And I'd like to move things over with, with Wanji to tell us really a bit about what the situation is of, of tennis in Kenya and in your country um, in terms of where you are in, let's call it the marketplace, with both you know, the broadcast world and the sponsorship world and the kind of progress that, that you, you hope to be making and that you are starting to make. Okay. Um, tennis in Kenya is facing a growth spurt right now. And that is mainly because now we have created a star. And um, I think Billy said something about the money following. And um, um, it's been a long journey. And the back end of it has been uh, we've invested in women's um, sport and a couple of years ago, led by our president, Mr. James Kenani, who's a women's ally, uh, decided that um, we, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, that we needed to consider women's uh, sport important and therefore uh, we started uh, equal pay like at the Kenya Open. Uh, so everybody is paid the same. We play similar events, and um, this has really spurred the growth of, of women's uh, sport. And also when it comes to things like broadcasting, uh, in Kenya we do not have the capacity to be able to do that, and therefore the, spo the sponsors are not really coming through. But again, when you see somebody like Angela, now, all of a sudden, this year, we have one sponsor for, for our W15s. So that has, uh, has really helped. Mm. There's been equality there because you were saying television it doesn't cover men's tennis or women's <laughs> tennis. So there's, so, there's, so there's equality. But you're making some progress, though, because you're, you're in line with what, uh, what Bill was saying. You're going to start streaming now. Yes, um, so we couldn't sit back and wait for you know, uh, things to happen which haven't happened. So we decided to take uh, matters into our own hands and we decided for W15, we are going to get somebody just to stream uh, because we can't wait for the main broadcasters and that is what has happened. So for this event, it's actually ongoing right now, we have somebody streaming and we are going to stream it on YouTube and just try to start getting our own numbers. Um, and hopefully the main broadcasters can then jump on and join us um, in a couple of years. And this is, this is a big change because the technology is there to be able to do this. And this is a very good thing for minority sports of all kinds. We call them minority sports or sports that don't have that big broadcast audience to at least start to have a presence. And it's nice to have television that can be complementary but I've seen many cases where you can start to build and, and, and from a small base and you can start to really make some, some inroads. You're, you're nodding, Bill. Yes, yeah. it's 100%. And I guess it's also not just the number of people that watch the streaming, but it's the stories. That's right. A lot of times, if you, as, as, as I think, I can't remember if it was Billy or Lana was talking about, when women are watching sports or the watchers of women's sports are more engaged. 
and they watch it more than their male counterparts. I'll give you an example. Um, a company I just sold last year was in Instagram, and the number of followers in women, let's say have 20,000 on average for these, call it 800 women, had three times the level of engagement than their male counterparts, three times. Mm. That means that if you were, had 20,000 followers as a woman, that's the same as 60,000 in a man. And those are the kinds of numbers that matter to corporations when you can Absolutely. show that kind of data. But it's not just the growth, it's the engagement and the stories that people care about. Absolutely. So you can't just look at one, you have to look at the story in its entirety. That's right, the numbers, the bare numbers are not, are not no. sufficient anymore. That's and in right. fact, when you're coming to sell, to speak to sponsors, that, that, you know, that, that doesn't work for a lot of them right. anymore. They want to know, they want to know more. Now, um, Wanji, you mentioned the success of Angela, who was a, a, got to Junior Wimbledon, um, was a, um, in Junior uh, Wimbledon doubles uh, success. And then it's made a difference in, in your country. But in your country, um, Salma, you have one of the top players in the world uh, now in Om Stravur. Tell us about, first of all, where did that come from? And then how did that, uh, what is the impact of? Uh, Andre Weber, our Minister of Happiness, uh, as you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know I'm like this, and uh, as you know, she has only 27 years old, and uh, she became uh, the first Arabic and African players to reach uh, two finals of Grand Chelem, uh, Wimbledon, and uh, US Open. And uh, since the age of uh, 17, Jeber uh, uh, has accumulated several uh, first titles. Uh, she was the first uh, Tunisian uh, and Arab player to win the final of, your, of the junior French Open, Roland Garros. Of course, uh, she's now at the top of the tennis world scene. Uh, and, uh, she's a very uh, talented player who does everything she wants with her hand. Since she was young, she can notice in her that nothing is impossible. And if she wants to achieve something, she will do everything in her power to achieve it. As you know, she has a lot of variety in her, uh, in her uh, unique, she has offered uh, a unique game which made her being the number two in the world. Of course, she so surrounds herself with the Tunisian team, it's very, very important, and she's always saying, I'm a 100% product of Tunisia. The impact of this performance in Tunisia is very enormous. Now, uh, the number of uh, uh, participants uh, has increased, uh, and uh, now uh, tennis is a huge game in Tunisia. All family believe that it's possible, so they bring their children, as they believe that there can be another ounce in the coming year. Ons uh, is a pioneer, is a pioneer, pioneer uh, that's why when I speak in English, <laughs> Elle est la pionnière du tennis. <laughs> we don't have uh, a tradition of tennis in Tunisia. We don't have a leader whose path we can follow. Now we have Ons, and really it's a great. Ons takes her statue as a role model to her. She has always said that she is, as you say, a 100 product of Tunisia. She's a source of a great motivation. The, you know, we were talking about grassroots uh, a moment ago, and the question is where, when you talk about investment, where the investment that goes into grassroots comes from. Um, and I think in your case, uh, Wanji, there's been you know, you've, you've had, uh, the, the ITF has been very much involved in that, and, and also in, in your case, uh, Salma. So if you could tell us about how, how that's worked in, in Kenya first, and then maybe a little bit in Tunisia as well, as to how, it, how it's helped um, what you're doing uh, in terms of your regional tennis center. Yeah, it has really helped um, from the very beginning. We used the JTI program, you know, for, to discover the talent, and we made use of that. 
And from there, Angela was picked for the High Performance Center, which again is funded by the ITF. And this happened in Burundi and, and in Kenya. Um, you find that when you have a center at one of your, like in Kenya, it produced many players because we had the top 16 uh, players in Africa training in, in Nairobi, and that really brought the standard of, of tennis up, but uh, more importantly, of Angela. And um, when that center was shut down, we sent her to Morocco, where she was able to build on her tennis in her final uh, junior years. And just when we were stuck and wondering what to do after COVID, then there was another ITF program, which was uh, the Grand Slam Tour Team, and we were able to apply for that. And um, she, she joined the team and started her, um, went to Australia on the ITF team. So this funding, as you can see, and it continued even Roland Garros and US Open, Wimbledon, she was all part of that ITF team. Uh, we would not have had the resources, but with that kind of funding that came through the ITF, we were able to get her to where she needed to be. Mm. And Selma, you have a new, you have your facility in Seuss as well. That, uh, yes. That, and, and how is this, has this come about in terms of the timeline for the and the, and, the, um, and the facility in Seuss, how has that happened? Yes, of course, the performance of ONS helped us to get uh, this center. But it was all, uh, also our dream to get uh, uh, this center, and uh, uh, we, we did uh, all our best to, 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 to get it, and uh, we have tried to choose the best appropriate place. It will be host uh, in Sousse. In Sousse, it's near Monastir, and Monastir where we host uh, 52 week, weeks of uh, 15,000, and uh, the idea to host uh, this center in Sousse, uh, the proximity of uh, the seat where we host uh, the tournament, uh, the, w, uh, the ITF uh, tournament, and also we host in, in this city uh, more than 10 uh, ITF uh, junior. Now the center located in one of the most beautiful uh, region, uh, the, the name is Sousse, Sousse is a seaside town. In the center, there is uh, eight uh, green set uh, courts uh, in, front of the, in front of the beach uh, and uh, a high standing door. Uh, a super pleasant setting that will allow this uh, young elite African player to progress and to improve themselves in the safety place also, it's a very safety, a safety place and it's very important because the majority of players perhaps they will have uh, under 16, under uh, 14 and it was our dream as Tunisian and it's a dream of all Africans to progress in a center and to have the opportunity to compete near the center, to not travel because it costs a lot. It costs yeah. a lot of their federation. And now, uh, that's why we, we want to thank uh, ITF to give us this opportunity and to give this opportunity to many African uh, center because really we have uh, many potential athletes that need support. And with uh, this center, we are sure that we will support them. In this center, uh, we, we introduce the scientific, uh, uh, let's say, we will follow them with the, in the uh, scientific, yes, research, uh, mm -hmm. on va faire de la research uh, scientifique, and uh, we will put the team with physical fitness and mental because it's very important when they are under 18, under 16, to uh, support them uh, mentally. And uh, I want to say that, uh, as you know, Tunisia, they, we have the proximity of all European country, one hour to hour, and you, you are in France or you are in Spanish, and it's very important if they want to play other uh, tournaments, they don't have to travel, to travel uh, a lot. We have uh, also, like I said, focused on the scientific research by doing a collaboration with the Center of uh, Optimization of Sport Performance, within the Medical University of SUS, of course, to offer the scientific uh, monitoring to the African elite. Uh, 
uh, one uh, of the best things in this uh, uh, in this uh, in this center that uh, we have eight uh, green set cards and also we have clay courts when they will go to play uh, ITF tournament or uh, other tournament in clay, they can uh, practice uh, also there. Excellent. Can, go can ahead. I, yeah, please. I just want to jump in and say, um, when you see Wenji and, and Selma, um, the importance of the Advantage All program, because I think it's one thing to have young girls playing but it's another thing, and it's hugely important to have female leadership. Uh, I think within the federations, mm -hmm. on boards, right. I think um, officiating, uh, in the media, coaching. So, um, you know, I really encourage all of you to invest in, in young girls and women, uh, not only on the court, but off the court, because they, they are the future, and. Um, I do think there's huge opportunity and a huge amount of talent. Um, and, you know, when you can see it, you can be it. So I think that's a huge part of this. And I'm hoping there's a lot of men in the room. And, and like Billy said, uh, if it weren't for the men who helped me or her on our journey, uh, we wouldn't be here. But it would be amazing for the men to mentor other women. Um, and we have seen it. A lot in corporations. Uh, a friend of mine, we used to work at Starbucks, and some of the women were afraid to go for senior jobs. And basically, he said, you have to go for it. And, but what was most important, he said to, to a bunch of these uh, female candidates, we won't let you fail. And I think Billy talked a lot about legacy and doing the right thing. And um, I would just encourage all of you to support others, help them, don't let them fail, because you really are investing in your own country and your own legacy. And, and there's an, another important aspect of that is diversity of thought, Absolutely. which is so important. We've seen this in so many different areas. If you are always going down the same path with the same people talking to each other and making decisions you're not probably heading in a good direction, especially in a more competitive and a more, and, and in the world that we have now. So diversity of thought is a positive thing regardless, right? Absolutely, uh, I, I, you don't I, want to surround yourself with people who tell you the same thing. Exactly, and you, you know, Billy, I, I would, Billy Jean, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, because we're, we're gonna run out of time fairly soon. There is a word that came up in the first session, which is authenticity, and I know it's something Bill has talked about in, 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 in authentic stories. And you're a person uh, uh, who is, throughout your, your career has always basically been quite authentic um, in terms of your- Or at least your try, person, to, try, try to, be, to try to find what that is. What yes. that, whatever that There's is. There's a journey for all of us and sometimes you, the truth today isn't the truth yeah, later. Uh, but do you think that, that women um, could help themselves by being more confident in, in being authentic instead of having to take that position of saying, well, I, you know, I'd like to run for office, but I, that's not for me, or I'd like to play in that tournament, but you know, I don't well, do those things. It's really, if you think about how we're socialized, girls are taught to be perfect, and boys are taught to be brave. And neither one is good, because no one, I mean, I mean you talk, you, we heard about Nadal and, and Federer holding hands and crying, for instance. Well, they're not socialized to be that way. But look how it touched everyone's heart and mind that that was authentic. And that's what's important. But girls tend not to have uh, self-confidence because we're told we have to be perfect all the time. We're the ones that have to wear makeup. We're the ones that have to worry about what we wear a lot more. Guys put on the suit and tie every day and they're fine. We have to go, oh God, what should I wear today? And, and I like makeup, so I'm okay with it, but it's, it's time though as well, and which is important. But I think it, it lends to that. It's that who are you and just go for it. And it's hard, it's, sometimes it's so hard. And if we have a voice, if, we ha if we're sitting at the table, women, it's only good if we have a voice at the <laughs> table. Not just be sitting there. And a lot of times uh, CEOs, are, they'll put women on the board or whatever, because you know, it says, okay, we've got X amount of women and all that. 
that doesn't count. <laughs> what counts is when they have a voice, you actually listen to them. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of studies where a woman will start to talk about a, an idea and they'll interrupt her and two people later, mm. the guy says exactly what she <laughs> said yes. and everybody will go, oh man, that's a great yeah. idea. It wasn't his idea, it was hers. So pay attention when you're listening uh, that everyone counts. You never know where a great idea might come from. It might come from an intern, you don't know. So, and to be your authentic self, for me, it's been a difficult journey, but it's been possible. Um, it's, it's just, it's just think about what I said at the very beginning. You'll never understand inclusion unless you've been excluded. And I think if you think about your own journeys, that's important. And what we're trying to do here is be inclusive of everyone, inclusive of everyone. And it's great when we have a big winner. She or he or they will inspire mm -hmm. people. But the real sheroes and heroes are grassroots. Your co Think about your own lives. Who are your sheroes and heroes, really? It's usually my coach, Clyde Walker, was my first coach. I talk to him every day. Hey, Clyde, I wish you could be on this journey with me. Are you? You know, so anyway, those are very, very important things to ask yourself. And I think it helps. And it helps with, I think Lori talked about bias or, or the, the panel before. And it's true, we're all biased. So we have to do gut checks all the time. Ask yourself, is this my bias coming up right now in my head or not? And try to just be open and get the best. And we have a chance, you guys are the leaders. You have a chance to change things for the better in each of your countries. And it really helps when you have a, a great player or a, a child or a young person, you see them go near the top. They're very inspirational. I mean, I know Owens, I've heard her story saying, without the ITF, I would not have made it. They helped me financially, hello, money. They helped me with coaching, that's still money. You have to pay them. It always goes back to money. And so that, that's why she made it. She said without the ITF, she wouldn't have made it to the positions she's in. So I want to thank everyone. Thank you to Tunisia, particularly. Um, so these are the things that matter, but thank you. And do, do try to be your authentic self the best you can. I mean, we're all in different, different phases of our journey. Well, well thank you to, to, um, to Billie Jean and to all of our panelists. My, my particular sporting prowess is sticking to a schedule. And, uh, and, it's, We're already and over. it's high noon, Sorry, I it's high noon, which is when I was told we have to finish. I'd like to give a big thank you to uh, our panelists here for a really good discussion. And uh, I'm going to turn things back over to Kat. But first of all, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go for it. I think we can just stay here. Uh, how about another round of applause here? for everyone here? <laughs> Thank you, Jay, and thank you for the insights and inspiration to all of our panelists that were here today. Um, you know, Advantage All is about facing challenges and we need inspiration to face them. We also need to focus on the immediate things that we can do right now to make sure that we can get this initiative moving forward. On that note, I want to mention that we have a very important I pledge commitment that I hope all the members uh, member nations and regional affiliates here today will be willing to sign up if you haven't already. I know many of you have done so. Um, but to make sure that we can have our tangible and public commitment to gender equality at all levels in our sport. We have a desk outside, so if you want to stop outside on your way to lunch to get more information or to pick up an Advantage All button to show your support, uh, we greatly appreciate that. And lastly, on behalf of the ITF, I want to thank everyone, both in Glasgow and online, um, who have joined us today. We hope you found this useful, insightful, inspiring, and enlightening. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank Kat. You. Thank you, Kat. Give it up for Kat.